Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back, Championship Leadership Podcast, and uh, I'm excited. I've, I've got uh, uh, a very special guest today, and Stephen Pressfield, um, author, uh, many, many books, and uh, a new book. And in case you are watching this, uh, here it is, right here, "A Man at Arms," the latest book that he's got out. Uh, thank you so much, Stephen, for being here today. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Nate. It's great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a little backstory, I was deployed to Kuwait as a platoon leader in 2005, 2006, and uh, came across your book, Gates of Fire. It was getting, it was, it was one that seems to uh, be passed around the, the ranks in the, inside of the military, which you probably heard that similar uh, story, yeah, I would yeah. imagine. And yeah. uh, so we were, my platoon, I would say probably all of my platoon ended up uh, reading that book and, and just loved it, devoured it. And then, you know, I got back home from deployment shortly after and the movie 300 came out, which, uh, which, which I was stoked about because I was like, oh, man, I just read this story in, in your book. And since then, I've worked with entrepreneurs and business owners. And right now, actually, we're currently going through your book, The War of Art. It's a book that I that I read probably every year at least. Oh. Oh, and, great. Uh, Interesting. I didn't know that, Nate. Huh. Yeah, it's an incredible book and, and one that, you know, that talks about resistance, of course, and and um, especially as an entrepreneur and a business owner, I face resistance on a daily basis, just like you you uh, in your book as a writer. And I think we yeah. all, all do. Right. So what a yeah. powerful book that is as well. Um, what's uh, if you could tell us a little bit about have you always like have you always had the talent to write have you always had the desire to be a writer or uh, where did this journey start for you um it actually i wrote for almost 30 years before i got something published so i was like i think 53 or 54 <laughs> years old before my first novel was published so it was certainly you know it was a long uh, passage but uh the way it started for me i never really wanted to be a writer as a kid it wasn't a dream or anything but i was uh my first job was in advertising in an advertising agency in New York City. And I had a boss named Ed Hannibal who wrote a novel and who quit and wrote a novel and it was an overnight hit, it was a smash. Oh wow. And so I thought, well, shit, why don't I do that? <laughs> yeah. And uh, it didn't quite work out for like another 30 years. But, uh, so it's been, uh, it's been kind of a long passage for me. Yeah. So one that you obviously were committed to, where, where did that come from? Was it easy to continue down that path? Uh, I had have to imagine it was a little bit frustrating. Uh, 30 years is a long time to continue uh, chasing after something. W what kept you going? Uh, you know, I suppose it's like entrepreneurship, you know, it's like once you sort of jump off the cliff, like once I committed to that first book and then I totally failed at that one, I choked like you know two weeks from the end and just blew everything up you know so shame was a big factor i just felt like i've got her you know sort of the bottom dropped out of my life at that point and i sort of felt like i had to write my way back out of it uh -huh. uh, but i really didn't have like a backup plan a you know it was like it's probably like a lot of your entrepreneurs that I tried to go straight a few times, you know, and take a yeah. real job and be responsible. But <laughs> I was like, so depressed at the end of the day, that I just I knew I just couldn't keep going. And then the other thing was that along the way, I did start to have a little bit of success here and there. Like, I had about a 10 year career as a screenwriter, where I was not really doing what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But I was in my field. And I was making money you know, not a lot of money, but enough to keep going. And I was learning my craft, you know, so I, I felt like, well, I'm, I haven't done what I wanted to do, but I'm kind of on the road to it. So that was, uh, you know, a combination of things that kind of kept me going through the, through those times. Yeah, absolutely. What, what would be, uh, what would be the, a moment for you where maybe it's like, uh, uh that, uh, highlight, moment of your career or maybe uh yeah just uh you know a, a moment that really was like man all right i can do this ah uh, that's a great question um probably realistically when my first novel which was the legend of bagger vance the golf story that became mm -hmm. a movie 
when that when that got published, I felt like uh, I can do this. But I did have moments before that, you know, working on movies where I felt like, um, you know, maybe I'm not doing great movies, but I am getting a paycheck and, and I can do this. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of a specific moment. Um, well, I had a tremendous failure in the war of art. I talk about this. Yeah. I had a tremendous failure with a movie called King Kong Lives, one of the all time <laughs> worst movies that uh, when it came out, I, I wrote I wrote it with a partner who actually was a really good writer who wrote the first Alien. So okay. he had really big success. And we the movie was made and we had seen it and everything. And we thought it was a hit. And we, you know, before it came out, right? And we yeah. invited all our friends to come to a screen <laughs> and like nobody showed up. I mean, only uh, and nobody other than our friends showed up. <laughs> and the next day in uh, the Hollywood Reporter, which is the, you know, the paper that reviews or, or maybe it was Daily Variety, I can't remember, but they said, uh, the review said, named my partner and me, it said, Ronald Chusette and Stephen Pressfield we hope these are not their real names for their <laughs> parents' sake. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, so that was, but paradoxically, I did feel like, you know, I'm in the arena. I'm getting the shit kicked out of me. <laughs> yeah. But at least, you know, I'm not driving a taxi cab or doing that sort of stuff. So I think at that point, I, I did feel like I was at least a pro, even if I was a pro that was getting the crap pounded out of them. Yeah. Absolutely. That's a great story. Um, what, uh, you know, King Kong lives. That's that reminds me. I was just listening to the radio and I guess there's a new King Kong movie out right now. King yeah, Kong yeah, versus Godzilla. Godzilla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe they you had a little something like to do with that. Who knows? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, by the way, just one thing from when you introduced me, Nate. Yeah. The movie 300 did not come from Gates of Fire. It came from from a graphic novel by Frank Miller that was just called 300. OK, so I, I don't want to either take credit for that or to blame for that. That that was. Yeah, that. no, I appreciate that. And I always wondered a little bit, but I mean, it, it's it's a very similar story. Uh, and I had just I mean, it's about fresh off historical event, obviously, but yeah. a totally different take. on Yeah. It, yeah. Um, what, uh, who are some of the people that have, have really impacted you? That's something that I, that I ask often, um, championship leadership, you know, who are some of the championship leaders that have impacted, um, you and your journey and, and, uh, and maybe paved the way for you before, before you, uh, got to where you are today inside of your career and your life and less about maybe who they are. Although please share that name if, if, if you feel, um, like doing so, but more so like what, what, what really is it about that, them, uh, what characteristics really stand out? You know, I've been, I've been thinking about that actually just on my own lately, Nate, and I, I re looking back, I feel like I've had many, many mentors. I probably had a hundred people that I could name, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of them, you know, uh, you know, my, my drill instructors and in boot camp, <laughs> like that, yeah. uh, coaches or bosses. It's almost always bosses, you know? Uh -huh. I'd call you into the office and ream you out, you know, and send you back out to do what you're supposed to do. Um, but um, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, like my, my part, my writing partner that I worked that I just cited in King Kong lives. Um, uh, his name is Ron Shusett. He's a real guy. Like I said, he was the one of the uh, <laughs> original guys with of the first alien, the Ridley Scott alien. And when we first started working together, I, he was like an established star. He was a brand name. And I was just a, you know, like an apprentice type of a young guy. And um, it turned, and so like Ron would say to me, this is kind of a little bit of a long story, but I'll give you this long story. Yeah. So he'd say, okay, let's start. We're going to work over at your house. I'll meet you at nine o'clock tomorrow. So I'm ready for him. I'm at the computer. Nine o'clock finally shows up like about 1230. <laughs> and the day I'm just shot, you know, I'm waiting for him. This went on for like two weeks or so. And each day it got later and later and later. And finally, I said to myself, you know, he's he's just not going to come. This, so I'm just going to start myself. So yeah. I, I would start at nine o'clock. And by the time Ron got there, I'd, I'd had like four hours of work. And I had a bunch of pages for the day. And I would show them to him. And I realized that that was what he wanted all along. That he yeah. was not really a writer writer. He was a producer writer. You know, he was like somebody who could evaluate material once he saw it, 
and have great ideas, but not somebody that would sit down and type it out, you know? Mm -hmm. So I realized then the lesson for that is pretty obvious. You know, it's like, don't wait for anybody else to do it, you know, right. just sit down and do it. But that was, so that was, uh, he wasn't actively trying to teach me or mentor me, but I, I learned a great lesson there to just go ahead and do it. Yeah. He's like, man, when is Steve going to pick up the hint that I just want him to start writing? I'm just going to keep showing up later. Yeah. You know, some people would tell you that right at the start. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to come until 12, so start working. But right. that was how it worked. Uh, that's, that's, that's good stuff. Um, where did, uh, where did the, the war of art come from? Um, you know, I've, like I said, I've, I've read it many times and uh, many people in my circles talk about that book and, and uh, influence that it's had on them. Um, so yeah, I would love you to talk a little bit about where that came from for you and why you decided okay. to write that. I know you mentioned even in the book that uh, it wasn't really at the time a, the type of book that you would write. Yeah, so, right. I had never done anything like that, which you might call, I hate to call it a self-help book, but I suppose it falls somewhere in that category. But yeah, what... Um, the way it came about was, you know, once if you're a professional writer or in any in any field and you're working and you're making money, your friends will kind of come to you and say things like, you know, I got a book in me. I know. Would you, you know, help me get started? And so I used to sit up till like two in the morning with various friends of mine and uh, trying to psych them up, you know, and it was clear that they were mired in what I call resistance with a capital R. In other words, they wanted to write a book, but they were terrified. They had self-doubt. They were sabotaging themselves. They were procrastinating, et cetera, et cetera. They were never getting going. So in helping them, I sort of uh, came to the, the one lesson that I would hammer at them over and over was the writing is the easy part. Sitting down to write is the hard part. Mm -hmm. You got to overcome that your own resistance, your own self-sabotage first. And of course, nobody ever listened to me. You know, <laughs> only one person actually wrote a book and it was a good book. Yeah. And I tried really hard to help him get it published. It never got published, but it was a good book. He was the only one. So finally, I just thought, I'm really getting tired of this shit. You know, I'm talking, staying up till two in the morning. I'm just going to write this down in like a pamphlet. And mm -hmm. then when somebody wants to know, I'll just say, here, read this. Yeah. So that was kind of how the War of Art came about. Um, and I, my uh, great editor and partner, Sean Coyne, I gave it to him. He had his own company then. And he said, this is not just for writers. This is for entrepreneurs and for artists yeah. of all kind. And so he said, let me publish it and we'll see if we can get it to other pe other people beyond writers. So that's how the book came about. I and love it. it. Yeah. Well, and it, it took it about is. two months to write. It was like one of the easiest books I ever wrote. That's what I love about the book is it's, it's really uh, easy to read. And it's just like every page is like, yes, <laughs> yeah, I can relate to every, every single page inside of that. And so, yeah, I'm glad that you decided to do that and put that <laughs> out. What's, um, what's the vision for you? Uh, like you said, it took you 30 years to get that first book published. And, and I uh, want to get into a man at arms here in a little bit as well. But um, obviously, you're continuing to write, and I would imagine that you don't see yourself really ever stopping, or maybe you do. I don't, maybe you could talk to that, but what's what's the vision for you and what you want to do um, as an author as you continue to go on here in, our, in this thing we call life? Uh, well, a Man at Arms is actually my 20th book. Wow. So I sort of went from nowhere to really doing a lot of work at, mm -hmm. at, at that point. Um, and I have another book. I don't know if you've seen. It's called The Artist's Journey. It's kind of a one of the. I think it's like the fourth follow up to a War of, the War of Art. Okay. And one of the things that I say in The Artist's Journey is, I think that at least for me, my life, my working life, was kind of divided into two parts. And I call the first part the my hero's journey, mm -hmm. where I was sort of bouncing around the planet trying to find my who I was and what my gift was. And at the, at the point that I found that, which was when the first book was published, I'm a believer now that your, your mind shifts and you go into a different journey, what I call the artist journey. And at that point, you're no longer a free range individual thrashing around. You become <laughs> yeah. like the blues brothers, you know, you're, you're on a mission from God. Yeah. Or you are on a mission. 
And you sort of, you now ask the question, it, it, let's say you found you, you, your gift, you know what it is. It's a, to be an entrepreneur, to be a writer, to be a filmmaker, whatever. Now you ask the question, okay, what is my gift? If I'm a writer, what am I supposed to write? What's the next book? You know, and how can I hone my instrument, meaning my, my mind, my schedule, my professionalism, my health, how can I put that kind of at the service of whatever this gift is? Like if you're Bob Dylan, you discover, oh, I'm, I'm writing songs. And then you go, the next, well, what, what's the next album, right? I just did Blonde on Blonde, you know, is the next one, you know, Highway 61 revisited, you know, that kind of thing. So from yeah. that point on, I really have been, at least in my career, a professional and just looking going from one project to the next and kind of asking the muse, my inspiration, what mm -hmm. do you want me to do next? And it's sort of, it's not for me, it's not in a, in a, you know, like some people write thrillers and they have a character that reappears over and over and over and they just kind of write another one and another one. Yeah. But for me, I kind of bounce around from one subject to another and it's sort of whatever grabs me. But I'm you're you're, you're right, Nate. I've don't have no intention of stopping. They're going to take me out feet first. Yeah. And I'm just happy to finally be in touch with my calling and to be able to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do you have? I know one project at a time. Is there a list of books or a list of ideas of things that you want to do as as you go on, or or is it really more of a just kind of in the moment? Once I finish this project, then I allow myself to think about what's next. Ah. Uh, that's a great question. I'm sure this is has application for entrepreneurs, right? Yeah, absolutely. What are you What are you going to do next, right? And sometimes it's kind of wildly different. But for, for me, as I'm working on, say, book five, I'm constantly asking myself, "What's books? I'm um, six. I'm looking mm -hmm. for a, a new idea, and I and I'll have a lot of bad ideas that I'll sort <laughs> of you know write down and keep in a file. And I hope finally one of them will grab me. And I go, yeah. and then I'll go, okay, that's the next one. Cause, and again, I, I know it's like entrepreneurship because for writing a book, it's like at least a two year commitment, yeah. two or three year commitment. Yeah. And, and a lot of times, if you're doing it on spec, you have to ask yourself um, and novels are always on spec because nobody gives you an advance. Sure. So uh, you have to ask yourself, am I willing to commit two, three years of my life to something that may be a dry well when all said yeah. and done? And uh, so I, I as that happened with entrepreneurs, right? It's a business. Yeah. Um, you're going to go in debt, you're going to, et cetera, et cetera. So once I, once I, um, but I am, I'm a believer, you know, sometimes people will ask me to invest in something, invest in the stock market or uh -huh. business. And my theory is I will invest in myself. Yeah. I'm going to bet on myself. I'm not going to bet on, something I don't know anything about Tesla yeah. or, you know, whatever it is, you know, right. Uh, Cause I'll never know what that is, but I'll bet on myself on the next thing. So I, I do go from one to the next, hopefully I've got, you know, while I'm halfway through one, I know what the next one's going to be. I hope. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think uh, betting on ourselves is probably the best investment we can make. Absolutely. Um, have you, you talked about that two to three year investment. Have any of those uh, investments, uh, those projects uh, not become or actually, you, you know, most of, them, most of them do, Nate, most yeah. of them bomb. Yeah. You know, there's actually going back to my old partner, Ron, who said he told a story about uh, a Broadway producer named Jed Harris was a famous producer back in the twenties and the thirties, had a lot of hits and uh, he was being interviewed by a young reporter and he, um, the reporter asked him, Mr. Harris, how do you explain the, the flops? And Harris started laughing and he said, that's not the question, son. It's how do you explain the hits? Yeah. In other words, you're going to have many more flops yeah. than you than hits, you know, and even yeah. when you have a hit, a lot of times, and this must apply to entrepreneurs too, it's not even your doing, right? It's almost an accident. Mm -hmm. The timing was right or you, you picked just the right slot, you know, you just got lucky somehow. Um, but a lot of almost, you know, probably the 
a man at arms right now is doing really well, largely because yeah. I promoted the shit out of it. Yeah, you are. But like the two or three or before that were complete bombs, you know, that uh, not even my family knows what they <laughs> so, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, entrepreneurship, I think we look at, we would look at it as like, basically, you know, uh, it's a chase to get as many no's as we can get. Cause that we know that that's one closer to a yes. Right. So yeah, so same thing that flop yeah. is just bringing you closer to that hit. Can I recommend a book for you guys and for your, yeah, for your listeners here? This is a friend of mine named Nick Murray wrote a book called the game of numbers. Okay. And, um, you have to kind of look it up, look him up. It's he sells it himself, like out of okay. his garage, yeah. he's got like 10,000 of these in his garage here. His son, and, but he's like a major um, coach and of financial planners. Okay. And if you're a financial planner, which I never knew, a big part of the business is cold calling. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. how how hard that is, right? Yeah. And so um, that brings up resistance with a capital R. You know? <laughs> big time. So yeah. Nick wrote this book. He's wrote, written a bunch of books, and basically what he says is just make five calls a day uh -huh. and don't count whether any of them were successful. And the reason the book is called the game of numbers is he figures, you know, it may take a thousand cold calls before you get the one person that will become a client. But if you just play the numbers sooner or later, it'll happen. And I yeah. think it's, that was a great, I immediately applied that to my own life as a writer, you know, yeah. just yeah. keep coming up with the ideas, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the game uh, of numbers I was, I was a financial great. planner and an insurance agent in a different life. And, and I, uh, I, I started my business uh, right out of the phone book, like A to Z. And so I can relate to that for sure. And it, it was a character builder, definitely. Um, but uh, yeah, how did if you, you could, mate, how did you deal with your resistance in making those calls? Yeah, well, before reading the war of art or really knowing what resistance was, I I didn't know any better. So I just kind of leaned into it and trusted the people that were telling me this is what I needed to do. And so I guess I just uh, naively and thankfully um, listened to them and, and did it. And yeah, there was always resistance, but um, I found a way, I guess, to to just not take it personal and know that this was just what I needed to do. Ah. Um, maybe you're probably instinctively. a rare person because it's huh? so hard not to take it personal, right? You know? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so some good stories there for sure. What's I see the typewriter back there behind you. Is that one that you use? Is that one? Uh, what, how do you write your books? Do you still use the typewriter? Do you use a, a no, computer use, like use, everyone else? You no, know, I use uh, this, this here, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's just too hard to write on a typewriter, but I did start for years. You did. I keep this old one, you know. I'm from back in the day where in order to edit, you would have to take a scissors and cut a paragraph out of a page and then scotch tape it, you know. <laughs> oh, it, man. You know? Brutal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To have a copy, you know, you'd have carbon paper. Yeah. Yeah, right, right. Um yeah, uh, thank you for yeah. I just saw that and I had to ask. I yeah. figured you've you've used that in the past, but could you tell us a little bit more um, about a man at arms? I would like to talk about that and what the story is all about for the listeners and and maybe even where where this book came from for you. Ah, well, I was you know I've written after Gates of Fire, which is as you know is about the three hundred Spartans. I wrote mm -hmm. four other books that were set in the ancient world and it was sort of military. You know, a couple about Alexander the Great and things like that. And then for some reason, I, I just thought I'm, I'm getting stuck in this one area. So I said, oh, let me go into the contemporary things. So for like 13 years, I only wrote contemporary stuff. Mm -hmm. And, but I always wanted to go back to the ancient world as I just sort of feel at home there. And I also had a recurring character, the character of Telamon of Arcadia, mm -hmm. who's the hero of a man at arms, who was sort of like a like a samurai character, like a lone warrior, you know, Yeah. in the first century AD. And people loved this character. He'd always been, he'd been in two other books, three books as a minor character. And people would write to me and say, when are you going to do a book that's only about this guy? Okay. And so I thought, um, I'll, can I give you the longer version of this story here? Yeah, you, absolutely. Worry, please, buddy. please. Well, here's a slightly longer version of it. A few years ago, my niece got married, my niece Meredith, 
and she asked me to do the be the officiant, marry her. You know, it was a, it's a long story. I'm not a priest or anything, but I did it. <laughs> yeah. But I, so I started looking up biblical quotations. You know, I went to the Book of Common Prayer. You know, for what I would read, and I came upon a bunch of things that I love, like love beareth all things, believeth all things, endureth all things, or um, faith, hope, and charity, and the great, or when I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, etc. And I realized when I picked these out that they all came from one place, which was the Apostle Paul's letter to the Corinthians that became yeah. the book in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians. So I, I forgot about it. I just, you know, went in my mind and went in one ear and out the other. And a couple of years later, I just got started thinking about this and I thought that letter must have been in the Roman times like the atomic bomb because mm. it was a new faith and Paul's letters were like changing the world. And I thought the Romans who were in charge then, they must have wanted to stop this letter. Yeah. And I thought this is, that's a story. Yeah. So I sort of mixed my hero Telamon in with that story. And I thought, you know, it, it's a, it becomes kind of a classic chase story trying to deliver the letter, all the bad guys are trying to stop you, bump it a bump it a bump. So that's how the book of Man at Arms came to be. Yeah, and I love the story. And, and it's really gotten me thinking as I'm reading through it, like I said, I'm not uh, finished with it. But, but um, it's, you know, I, I'm a Christian, and uh, I'm on, I'm on a very beginning part of that journey for myself and learning a lot yet. But uh, it's really got me thinking as I'm reading this book about things that I wouldn't questions thoughts that never really came to my mind that you have me thinking about just like you said with this letter and how uh how crazy of a time that had to be to live in in the romans and you know how bad they would want to get their hands on that and uh yeah so i, I love it it's 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 an incredible story so wait till you get to the finish nate what's yeah i can't wait <laughs> got a slam bang finish uh <laughs> Um, one more question here. I do want to uh, respect your time um, and I appreciate you being here today, but um, this is a question I like to ask because I think a lot of the listeners, especially the times that we're, you know, these are difficult times in our life, um, 2020, 2021 now and the pandemic and everything else that's going on in the world. But um, what's a, if you could think of a, a critical moment or kind of that fork in the road is what I like to say where oftentimes people kind of know which way they want to go, but they feel pulled maybe the other way by others or maybe because it's the more, what they think the more certain or safe path. Um, you know, obviously this moment you decided to, to, to choose and take the path that you did, which has you where you are today, but had you chose differently, you'd be in a very different place than you are today. Uh, is there a moment that pops up that you could share with the listeners? Um, the one thing I, I would say, Nate, is, there were a lot of moments. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a famous story about Walter Matthau, the actor, where he was on a, a set with a young actor and the, and the actor said to him, you know, Mr. Matthau, I'm just looking for that one break. I just gotta have that one break. And Matthau started laughing and he said, kid, it's not the one break, it's the 50 breaks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And when I look back, I think that there were many forks in the road where you know, you think you've made the fatal choice, the good choice, right? You think, oh, now I've really committed. Now it's going to work. Yeah. But, you know, obstacles arise, yeah. you know, and three months later, you're faced with, an, with another choice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but um, uh, the, the one thing, this is probably will not, maybe this is a little too airy-fairy for the, what we're talking about here. But I am a big believer in listening to my dreams, dreams at night. Not mm -hmm. my dreams. Oh, I dream I'm going to yeah, you know, okay. whatever. But, and I've really found that that is a source of wisdom that wherever it's coming from, the unconscious, you know, the divine ground, wherever it is, dreams are almost always pointing you in the right direction. Even a dream that seems like a nightmare on the surface, mm -hmm. when you start to analyze it, a lot of times I've had a bunch of dreams that really pointed me at crucial moments. And I'll recommend another book for your listeners. Yeah. It's, a, it's a wonderful, a short book like The War of Art. It's called Inner Work by Robert Johnson. And Robert Johnson is a famous Jungian psychotherapist. And the book is just about interpreting dreams. 
and okay. it's very, very simple. And it kind of gives you a framework to do that. And uh, um, many times, even right now, I'm sort of starting a new project mm -hmm. and I'm in the throes of indecision and self doubt and yeah. that kind of thing. And I've had at least three big dreams over the last month that were sort of encouraging me, you know, telling me, don't yield to that self doubt. Yeah. So I would, I would, uh, it, I, that's a, a great source of wisdom. It's a, it's a mentor to me is my own dream. Yeah. And it's called again, the inner work. Is that what it's just called inner work without the inner work, inner work Robert by Johnson. Robert Johnson. Okay. You can get it on yeah. Amazon or anywhere. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll get that linked up too in the show notes. Yeah, um, don't forget Nick Murray's the game of numbers. It's a great yeah, absolutely. The game of numbers as well. Um, one last final question here for you. Um, you know, if there were one or two things that you could give, call them guiding, uh, guide points or principles that you live by, or, uh, just, uh, pieces of advice that if the listeners were to implement and, and put into action today in their life that help move their life forward to today, what would that be? Um, well, just what I said about listening to your dreams, that's a, that's a key yep. one. But also I think that, uh, if you're, if you're of the entrepreneurial mindset, it's very hard to work for somebody else, isn't it? Yeah. It's hard to be yeah. advancing somebody else's dream. Um, but um, the one thing I would say is it's, it's cause there's always a temptation to, to jump off the cliff, you know, go into hock, you know, mortgage the, you know, the ranch. And, <laughs> yep. and I think, um, you're not a pussy if you don't do that, you know, sometimes right. it takes, you know, you have to wait till the time is right before you can pull the trigger and, and it can, it can, it can backfire if you get a little too crazy and you're, you know, you're too ready to jump off the, the top of the empire state building. Yeah. So, um, but on the other hand, boldness, you know, fortune favors the bold. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to be said for that, you know, arrogance and ignorance are the entrepreneurs two best friends. <laughs> yes. Um, I appreciate that. And that's, uh, yeah, absolutely good advice as well. So um, thank you so much. It's really been an honor to have you here today. Um, I appreciate it. What's, uh, what are some ways that we can get our hands on a man at arms? And, you know, it's uh, everywhere. It's on Amazon or, and all that. And uh, we even have a few bonuses and prizes going. But yeah, if I just go to my website, which is just my name, Stephen Pressfield, Stephen with a V. And thanks, right. thanks for having me, Nate. One of the, one of the things that it, it's great that anybody that's listening to this is using you as an advisor and a coach. You know, it's also great as an entrepreneur to get help and to get some yeah. wisdom from somebody and not be all out there, you know, on planet 51 all by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, you have an incredible day. Thank you. All right. You too, Nate. Thanks a lot for having me. I'll talk to you again. Absolutely. All right. Bye for now.